<laughs> I did. All right, Thank welcome. You. Welcome back, Pet Health Junkies. We're so excited to have a very special guest with us today. And but before I introduce them, Pam and Janet are both with me. And this is newer for us, right? Like we have had a couple of guests and we always love having guests, but um, you guys have just come out of the woodwork saying, please bring more guests. <laughs> so we are trying to deliver on that for y'all. And we have a very, very special guest today. Um, somebody we have been talking about having on the podcast for quite a while and finally decided to reach out to him. And a topic that is you know, there are always like trending topics going on and every, every something will go viral and everybody's talking about it and then everybody drops it and then somebody finds another topic that goes viral. And so this, but this one I feel like is worth it. This one, yes, everybody is talking about it and you want to know about it for your pets and for you personally, by the way. And I think this one is this one is definitely going to like stand the test of time. So today's episode, we have Dr. Rob Silver from Real Mushrooms. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I think what mm -hmm. is normally when I see you, most people are just like Doc or Doc Rob. <laughs> so whatever you prefer to be called, um, we're, we're here for it because mushrooms are some of them i mean i finally i want to say it was last october finally watched fantastic fungi and yeah. i'm just like whole like my brain exploded with how fascinating mushrooms really are i feel like you probably know it's a topic that <laughs> like once you get into it you are never going to get out of the weeds. There is so much we don't know that we don't know mm -hmm. on top of the things that we do know. So thank you so much for being here. We're so happy to have you. Yay. I'm really happy to be here and you can call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. Um, <laughs> um, Doc Rob is probably just as easy as anything else. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, um, Janet and Pam, and uh, like we have a bunch of questions lined up for you, and I just kind of want to set the groundwork because what I did before um, starting this recording today, I went to answer the public, and I'm like, what do people out there, what are they searching on Google about mushrooms and dogs specifically, though Pam is going to ask you some questions about cats, I know. Um, and more often than not, what I'm seeing out, outside of the like, what about this specific mushroom or this specific mushroom? I'm seeing a lot of questions. First of all, are mushrooms safe for dogs? People are still asking this question. And are, are mushrooms toxic to dogs? So if we can just like maybe get a baseline with your answer to those questions, and then we can kind of get more specific because apparently there are people out there that don't know. Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people do think that mushrooms are toxic to dogs. Most of the time that a dog has an opportunity to eat a mushroom, it's in the backyard after a rainfall, and typically those could be toxic mushrooms. As yeah. veterinarians, that's one of the you know that's one of the first things we think about when a dog comes in vomiting or sick or with elevated liver values is have they gotten into some mushrooms in the back? So it's reasonable that people would have that question, mm -hmm. and. So yes, some mushrooms are toxic. There's a wide variety of different species of mushrooms. There's four basic types of mushrooms. We've got our edible mushrooms, our shiitake and our, our, our button mushrooms and our, our gourmet mushrooms like maitake and oyster and lion's mane, you know. Um, we've got our medicinal mushrooms and many of the edible mushrooms are also medicinal, um, which is good um, because you enjoy taking your medicine then. Um, but some mushrooms are toxic. They, it's estimated from one textbook I read that maybe 1% of all mushroom species are toxic. But if you happen to eat that one toxic mushroom, <laughs> it's enough. They say that they say you can eat any mushroom once. That's kind of a, a, a kind of a folk. You know? um, but and then there's also the psychotropic mushrooms, mm -hmm. the uh, 
psilocybin and the amanita muscaria, which have been in use by indigenous peoples for literally thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And although they're not toxic, they do have their own issues and we won't go there today. So, um, so when you look at buying mushrooms from a company, okay, as compared to foraging them yourselves in the woods or buying them at the supermarket or buying them online, if you can actually buy fresh mushrooms online, and maybe you can, um, you know, you, 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 the company you're purchasing it from, it's their responsibility to have a positive identification of that mushroom so that you know what it is you're taking. So a company like Real Mushrooms that actually grows the mushrooms, we know exactly what our mushroom products are, and we know they have a long history of safety in humans and also limited use in pets. But what we know about their use in pets is also safety. Not generally recognized as safe, which is kind of an official designation, but they call commonly used foods. Mm. And, and so they allow now in pet food button mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms as well because they're co in common use and have shown themselves to be very safe. I went to a mushroom conference two weeks ago in Vegas, and they had a, this one researcher with uh, the City of Hope Cancer Center that found that white button mushrooms, those simple mushrooms you buy at the supermarket, have huge medicinal benefits, especially with breast cancer and prostate cancer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so mushrooms are a variety of things, and you need to have good identification of the mushroom to be sure that you're eating something that's not toxic. Talking about an edible mushroom, talking about medicinal mushrooms, not toxic to dogs, not toxic to cats, based on our experience. We don't have the kinds of, of safety studies, which also involve um, um, sacrificing the experimental subjects and doing um, um, histopathology on their organs to ensure its safety. We don't have that. I don't want to do that kind of study. But mm -hmm. mushroom, 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 so yes. So the answer to your simple question is mushrooms are safe for pets, as long as it's coming from a company that's reputable in their ability to identify. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that distinction of trusting the company that you're getting your products from is so it's important. important. Yes. yes, and it cannot like stress that enough, no matter what product it is that you're looking at. Com there's a, a nonprofit organization in the herbal realm called um, the American Botanical um, Council. Well, they published Herbalgram. And um, their big thing now is the adulteration of herbs. A lot of company, a lot of countries, companies mm -hmm. are finding herbs that look similar to the herb that they're trying to get. That's more, much more expensive. Mm -hmm. And they're substituting this non, you know, this non-identical herb because it's cheaper. They make more money. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it is important to have that kind of positive identification with anything that you're using that's being grown somewhere, you know, and also certificates of analysis. We have, we, we triple um, analyze all of our products to make sure they're free of heavy metals, they're free of, of pathogens, they're free of, of pesticides and solvents, and all that stuff, and, mm -hmm. are, and that they're standardized to their potency in terms of the beta-glucan content. So these are important things if you're going to be using them effectively. Yeah, well, I think that brings up one of the questions that we have somewhere. Yeah. Oh, no. We were it's on the, it on is. The well, yeah, with mushrooms being bioaccumulators, again, having uh, yes. that trust. Where they're, where they're grown, yes, where they're grown, mushrooms can concentrate whatever is in the soil or whatever is on the wood that they're growing on. Um, and in many ways, this is good because we're now finding we can use mushrooms to actually bioremediate toxic waste. And it turns the toxic waste into, into something that's actually safe and edible. They've wow. even been growing mushrooms on baby, on baby diaper waste and um, converts the baby diaper waste to edible mushrooms. So many people are saying, because, you know, our, our planet's having some issues right now. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Um, and, and and many people say that mushrooms may be the solution to so many of our global problems in terms of when, if we can just get the rising temperatures under control, because there is a relatively narrow space of temperatures that mushrooms grow in. So, you know, we may wind up losing some of them as well as, as things get worse out there. I would like to 
touch on, and this is not in our outline, but I'd like to touch on something that you mentioned about whether it's grown on wood or dot, 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 dot. So as mushrooms have become more popular and, you know, we're seeing them in pet stores and, and online a lot, um, you, you hear people talk about they're grown in a basement with artificial light. These are grown in the woods with sunlight. These are grown on wood. These are grown in a tub on oats. Can you talk about what is maybe right and wrong is not the correct, you know, describe description there, but can you touch on what the ideal environment is for growing mushrooms? Like when, go ahead. Certainly we don't want to grow the mushrooms on anything that has toxins in it in terms of the bioremediation aspect. If we're going to be using them later without first analyzing them to make sure the toxins aren't in them. But, um, and mushrooms are very, um, very robust in their ability to convert whatever the crap is they're growing on, you know, into something that's functional and effective and maybe even tasty. So I think some of what you're discussing, Janet, has a lot to do with the way different mushroom companies try to position themselves against other mushroom companies so Mm -hmm. people are likely to buy their stuff. Exactly. I don't really want to get into that too much. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I've been promoting a little bit of real mushrooms, but I want to just give you the facts, which yes. is that there are studies that show that mushrooms grown on their native substrate, substrates such as because we have basically have two categories of substrate for mushrooms. We've got the wood lovers, and we've got you know the the dung lovers or the compost or leaf lover, leaf, mm. leaf lovers, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. So, you know, you need to grow your wood-loving mushroom on wood so it can extract the valuable nutrients in the wood that it needs for its growth. Likewise, a wood-loving mushroom is not going to do very well or even grow at all on the compost. These things, what they're doing is they're taking a lot of the wood and wood chips and they're putting them in these plastic bags that have like a little air air filter on it, and they're inoculating it. Um, with the mycelium that's been grown on a grain to begin with. We call that grain spawn. And in the cultivation of mushrooms, that's the first step, is we take the spores or the mycelium from a given species, millet, rye, um, oats, these are common, rice, these are commonly used grains. They grow the the mycelium on. The mycelium mushrooms grow really good on grains. And um, oftentimes, if you know tempeh, what happens is you wind up getting like a tempeh-like like product, which is, you know, white mycelium and then the, the, um, the grain in there. And so this classically and historically has been the spawn. They take this mycelium that's actively growing into the grain, and then they put it on the native substrate. And on the native substrate, like wood, maybe they'll inoculate a wood, a wood, a plastic bag that has wood chips on it, or maybe they've got a stump, you know, that they've mm-hmm. drilled a hole in it, and they put the spawn in that stump, and then they cover it with beeswax. That's another way to inoculate it. You can buy shiitake mushrooms. You buy logs. Seriously, they'll sell you these big logs that have these holes drilled in them, and they put the grain spawn in the logs and cover them with beeswax. You put them out in your backyard, you know, and they grow. It's so cool. I mean, we're seeing a lot of this happening, and you get, you know, every day you get fresh shiitake mushrooms. And so, um, so sunlight is is helpful only up to a certain extent. When mushrooms need sunlight, they don't need much. So it's not really as important. They're not photosynthetic organizations, they are um, organisms. They don't really use the sunlight to generate energy like plants do. Mm. So it's not that important. But once the mushroom's grown, if you expose it to ultraviolet light, it converts one of the molecules in it called ergosterol into the dietary precursor for vitamin D. So, I mean, mushrooms are amazing as a polypharmacy in terms of all the amazing ingredients that they contain. Some companies are taking the grain spawn and instead of cultivating it into a mushroom, they take the spawn, maybe it has grown one little mushroom out of it or whatever, and they dry it and they powder it and then they sell that as a mushroom-like compound. They may put it in a, bo- a jar that has a picture of a mushroom that says turkey tail. So you're thinking you're getting a turkey tail mushroom when in fact you're getting the grain, uh, the grain spawn. Now, 
I think mm-hmm. grains form, and people talk about having potency. They're seeing effects when they take these products that have grains spawn in them. I think some of that is the placebo effect, which accounts for 30% of all positive results whenever you're taking something. Is mm-hmm. what's in your mind. It's not a bad thing. It just shows the, the healing power of the mind, really. Um, and, um, and so... Um, they think they're getting so so what this grain spawn really is it's a postbiotic and this is a new a new definition of a nutraceutical which is you've got our prebiotics which is food for the probiotics or the microbiome we've got the probiotics which is food for the microbiome and then after the probiotics are dead we have all these secondary metabolites from the probiotics fermenting either the digester or the grain and these secondary metabolites have um medical value. So I think there is medical value to these to these um, mycelium grown on grain products, but they're not mushrooms. And mushrooms historically have been, you know, the 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 fruiting body has been what we go for. Historically, all of the the um, ethnobotanical medical systems use the fruiting body. They don't right. use the mycelium. Now, as technology has improved, they now are able to grow the mycelium not on grain, but they grow it in a liquid culture. And that liquid culture does allow the mycelium to grow to its fullest extent. And you can separate the mycelium from the liquid, which you can't do with the grain. So this is where you, maybe you've heard about turkey tail being good for a certain type of cancer in dogs. Um, mm-hmm. Imagine coma, cancer of the spleen. Well, that study wasn't done with the turkey tail mushroom. It was done with the extract of the mycelium grown in liquid culture in a pharmaceutical kind of context. So yeah. the PSP, which is what the, that extract's called for the turkey tail that was relatively successful for this disease, and it, there's some details about that. It's not, it didn't cure the disease. It just slowed down its progress. Um, mm-hmm. But um, so, you know, so that's that's where we're seeing that kind of um, that kind of product from mycelium. It's more of a pharmaceutical product than really a whole mushroom mm-hmm. kind of a product. I don't know if I answered your question or not, Janet. I'm, you, no, you uh, did. It's fascinating. It maybe, was. <laughs> I'd like to stop the podcast so we can stop and, and learn and take notes right now. <laughs> Just <laughs> and listen to you for a few hours. Right. <laughs> Uh, that kind of leads us into another one of my questions, which was about mushrooms and their um, medicinal properties and the effects that they can have on different types of cancer. Um, and you you touched on that. Would you like to say anything else about okay. um, mushrooms and cancer? Yeah, you know, cancer. Although I'm not an oncologist, um, as an alternative. A holistic practitioner, cancer has always been a big challenge for me to address. Mm-hmm. I've um, it's a great. I like the part of the challenge the more I like it. So mushrooms contain multiple components um, ingredients, and all mushrooms contain similar but different, you know, but species specific components. So first we have what are called beta glucans, and beta glucans are a form of polysaccharide that's not digestible, mm-hmm. and Beta-glucans make up a major part of the cell wall of every fungus organism out there, including mushrooms. But mushrooms have another polysaccharide in their cell wall called chitin. And you may be familiar with chitin because it makes up that hard exoskeleton of lobsters and crabs and fleas. Um, and chitin is a precursor for glucosamine. Um, but the and the chitin doesn't have any anti-cancer properties, but the beta-glucan has huge anti-cancer properties, and it has its anti-cancer properties primarily through the white the cells of the white blood uh, the white blood cells in the body, because the beta-glucans um, um, bind to the membrane receptors on these white mm-hmm. cells and activate them so they can become more vigilant to scarf up whatever cancer cells might be going on there or help to reduce inflammation or with infectious agents, antiviral, you know, these these resistant bacterial infections. Beta-glucans are awesome this way. They're starting to use beta-glucans now instead of antibiotics because they're finding that because they reduce infection in the body, which is what the idea was with the antibiotics, they promote growth. 
promote growth in, in animals that are food animals, you know, the industry likes that because it doesn't create antibiotic mm. resistance. It's cheaper than antibiotics and, and mm -hmm. it's easy to get into the feed. So, um, so that's the beta glucan thing. But there's other, other ingredients in the mushroom called um, terpenes or triterpenes. And for instance, turkey tail mushroom, the mushroom, not the extract, has the, law, the highest percentage of beta glucans in the mushroom. But it also has the largest number of terpenes. And so many, and it's not like one beta glucan, it's mo many, many uh, modified versions of the beta glucan molecule, which make it even more potent. Because it gets it this way, it gets it that way, it gets it this way, it gets it that way in terms of the beta glucans. And then you get a one two punch with the beta glucans setting them up and the terpenes knocking them down. So, turkey tail historically has been an anti cancer mushroom because of those high levels of terpenes and beta glucans. But there's other, I mean, almost all mushrooms have the beta glucans, like even the white button mushrooms, as I mentioned, can have an impact on certain types of cancers. Um, so chaga, for instance, which actually is a non-mushroom, is um, chaga is is actually a canker that grows on the birch tree. The mycelium um, infects the birch tree like a parasite, and then the birch tree reacts to it by creating what looks like a cancer on the tree. In ancient days, humans would look at what a a natural thing looked like. Like let's say they see a bean that looks like a kidney, they go, oh. That's probably good for the kidney, you know, mm -hmm. or they got something like lion's mane, which looks like a brain, really. Um, and they go, oh, that must be good for the brain. You know, so chaga looks like a cancer. So they used it to treat cancer and it does treat cancer very well. Even though it has lower beta glucans, it has really high terpenes in it. So, and then, you know, shiitake mushroom, you know, we talk about how edible it is. You can grow it on logs. There's as much research on shiitake as there is on ginseng and garlic, you know, and, and echinacea. I mean, a huge amount of research and a lot of work that's been done to isolate, um, um, isolate individual constituents of the shiitake mushroom that can be commercialized and sold to treat cancer. And so we see quite a bit of that being used in Japan, which is kind of the, the, the source of shiitake, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We see it happening in, in other countries where mushrooms are being used medicinally, such as China, other places, Asia, and Eastern Europe as well, where the culture has always embraced the use of mushrooms for, for food and for medicine and for ecstasy. Don't forget that. Did that work? Was that the right thank answer, you. Janet? Did yes. You want to thank you question? for explaining that. And that leads into the next question. And then I will be quiet the rest of this time, <laughs> which was uh, aside from cancer, but for generic um, immunity. So as our pet parents are tuning in and listening and, um, you know, I'm, we're all three as I'm, and I'm going to loop you in here too. All, all of us are so happy to, to see that. I, I feel like we're moving towards a mindset of wellness. Um, and I don't know if it's, you know, the right time to say there's a movement, but there is an awakening or an enlightening and in, in thinking that, you know, um, what we've been doing has not been working for our pets or for us as well as we'd like. And so there's this wellness movement. And so in my own store, our supplements have just been our largest growth area and our fresh food, which are two wonderful things to see. And, you know, because of the benefits. So if we could talk before we move on just about what, would you suggest on a daily basis for immunity? Um, what is there a type of mushroom? And then I think Pam, you had a question about you know what about the delivery method? You know tincture versus powders, and mm -hmm. and if you want to talk about it for pet parents as well, but but mainly for our pets, what would you recommend? But mm -hmm. we see mushroom coffee, <laughs> so, well, all these and things. And, you know, some of those mushroom coffees are so tasty because they've got mostly grain and mycelium. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. Yep. So, um, so as far as, you know, maintaining health, creating and maintaining health, 
one thing that we have learned is that there seems to be a synergy when you're using multiple mushrooms all together at the same time. Mm -hmm. so they don't have a use for a specific mushroom for a specific reason. For instance, the cordyceps mushroom tends to concentrate in the lungs, concentrates in the kidneys. If you have lung disease, I'm going to suggest the cordyceps mushroom maybe right. paired with the turkey tail mushroom to get the benefit of the turkey tail and direct it to the lungs, you know? So, um, but if you're just looking at general wellness, then, um, and let's talk about real mushrooms in terms of what they offer as far as a product, because I think that'll make, make, make them happy, which is we have a single most popular product is a blend of five potent mushrooms, which mm -hmm. include the chaga, include the shiitake, include the maitake, include the turkey tail and the reishi. Mm -hmm. So these are five hugely powerful mushrooms. We have them all standardized, so they all have the highest potency possible. We do extractions where we can actually concentrate their potency so we can get a very potent product inside a little capsule. So we do that. And so that's the most, and there's a reason for it being most popular. And um, this is what I suggest for wellness. Now, um, I've designed some soft chews that have the five defenders in it. Um, I only put one bottle back here, but that's not the right one. That's that. That's the relaxed chews, but I have immune chews as well. And we also, I'm talking about formats now. I'm kind of shifting over to that. Mm -hmm. We also have the five defenders in a bulk pouch powder, which is very easy to dose, maybe an eighth of a teaspoon for 10 or 20 pounds of body weight once or twice daily, depending on the need of the individual. We have it in small capsules that we have labeled for pets. We have it in large capsules that are labeled for humans. So mm -hmm. four different four, four different formats, which um, make it very accessible to almost everybody. So that's what I take myself. And um, I take a few other mushrooms as well to influence other systems in my body. But I use that as my baseline. And it's a real easy place to go. And um, you know, so that would be or delivery vehicles. Now, you brought up the question of tinctures. And um, tinctures tend to be, I think, popular amongst pet owners. I know that, you know, I've been an herbalist for many, many years. And initially, the only herbal formulas we had available were alcohol tinctures, which yep. um, do a very good job preserving the actives and, 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 and extracting the good stuff. But you know, we're probably the only animal that really likes alcohol to drink. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, your friends don't much care for it, so you have to somehow dispel the alcohol. So the second generation of tincture became used glycerin as well. And mm -hmm. the glycerin doesn't do as good a job of preserving the alcohol, but it's sweeter. And so you can, so it's more compliant for pets. But the thing about a tincture, whether it be a an oil-based tincture, like we call the CBD tinctures, or it be an alcohol-based tincture, like some of those early um, herbal tinctures were. And we can see alcohol tinctures of mushrooms, but the only thing that the alcohol can extract from the mushroom is not the beta-glucans, but the terpenes. Because the terpenes are, are fat-soluble, so they're soluble in alcohol. The beta-glucans are water-soluble, so they're not. They tend to precipitate out and become solid in a tincture. So it's hard to get higher levels of beta-glucans into a tincture so that you could have enough in there that you don't use the whole bottle up at once to dose a, a larger animal. I think tinctures have a time and place if you're trying to dose a small animal, that mm -hmm. it may be easier to use a little sweet glycerite type of a solution, a couple mm -hmm. of drops or whatever for a smaller animal to get it in them. You know, although I think one could just as easily use a 16th or an eighth of a teaspoon of powder. It's not much powder at all. And mixing in with the food is no problem. So, um, but I think tinctures, ha you know, can have a time and place. I just think that um, you have to be careful about the claims that are being made by companies about their tinctures in terms of their potency. We have no way of measuring beta-glucan content um, in a liquid format. It has to be freeze dried in order to be analyzed because they, the methodology, we don't have a liquid methodology yet. Now, maybe nuclear magnetic resonance or maybe um, M or, uh, um, liquid chromatography mass specs, something like that might be able to do it. But in terms of common, affordable ways of analyzing it, we, we don't really have a way of, of measuring the beta glucan 
content in liquid. But but you know these are all different options, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if um you know if we saw some other you know if we, if we started seeing some other ways to to give mushrooms as well, maybe some transdermals, you know, or liposomal. I mean, you know, the nutraceutical industry is huge and getting huger all the time, and so the technological advancements as far as product format keep changing. That's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure. Awesome. You have some questions, Pamela? Well, I was just coming over here to see what I wrote down. Um, you know, cats tend to be very neophobic. Neophobic? <laughs> neophobic. They don't like anything new. Um, yeah. and, they <laughs> and they certainly don't like anything that tastes bitter and, and yucky, like a lot of herb tinctures. So do you have a favorite that you have used with cats that they tend Definitely. to be really receptive to? Yes. Oh, tell me. Um, as, as a holistic doctor of many years, um, I am actually also quite good with that particular species. Um, we have several in the house right now. Mm -hmm. Much to the dismay of my canine friend, because um, they're always in his face. They're Maine Coons. So, oh. um, so... You so in terms of the taste of the mushroom powders that we're talking mm -hmm. about, I think of all the 10 different mushroom species that we sell, the two that would be most applicable to a cat would be our lion's mane powder, mm -hmm. but most especially our cordyceps powder. And mm -hmm. that's because the cordyceps has this protective effect on the kidneys. And nice. I, I believe that mm -hmm. cordyceps should be given to kittens throughout their entire life at a fairly low maintenance level. And then when you do get to the point where you have some frank, chronic kidney disease issues beginning, you can then up the dosage. I don't have evidence for this. I'm just making that mm -hmm. I'm making it up because and I know what does. There are studies that show that in laboratory animals with experimentally induced chronic kidney disease, the cordyceps has lowered their creatinine levels. So That's creatinine awesome. Value awesome. when it comes to kidney, cats with kidney value, and eighty-five percent of all chronic kidney disease patients are feline. Right. So I, I think cordyceps is really um, the way to go with kitties, and um, we're we're coming out soon with another product. We, you know, we have our daily dog. I don't know if you guys knew about that or not. It's a it's kind of a there it is. It's a once once a day a meal topper that has a lot of probiotics and microbiome friendly and immune modulating things, but we're coming out with another one that's going to be more directed towards kitty cats. Nice. And one, one of the main changes I made with this was just to bump up the cordyceps quite a bit. So it has that value to it as well. Do you see the benefit of using that in addition to nettle? Because Rita Hogan loves nettle for kidney for cats. She's I, turned her cat around, so I was curious what you think. Um, I love Rita. I think if Rita says it's true, I agree with her. Um, <laughs> But I think that my use of, of nettle leaf, because uh, I also consider myself to be an herbalist. Yes, um, you are. I <laughs> have some credentials, too, um, is I would be more likely to use the nettle leaf with an active problem with chronic kidney disease. Okay. I don't think that, act, that nettle leaf is going to be preventative. It might be, but I haven't really learned about it in that context. So I think right. there would be no reason at all not to use both of them together. It could mm -hmm. be a really nice little formula be made up with some nettle leaf and some cordyceps. Now, my understanding of the nettle leaf, though, is that it 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 tends to be you no. Know, uh, okay, I'm sorry. That's nettle leaf for allergies. I had thought that it was actually the nettle root that was better for a kidney disease than the, the nettle leaf. And nettle leaf was more of an allergy type of thing. But um, I'll I'll be get I'll be I've been communicating with Rita. I'll ask her about that. And see what she said. Yeah, I don't recall in our interview if she meant leaf or root, but she mm -hmm. she, just, she just said she just said nettles. Yeah. Well, I know when I made my 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 chronic kidney disease formula for Arx Vitamins, I wanted to put um, nettle root and asparagus root in there because they're both considered to be good for um, kidney yeah. disease, and they were really hard to find. I we actually mm -hmm. weren't able to find them in the commercial quantities that we needed for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to know. 
Yeah. Cordyceps, I'm adding it to my kidney list. <laughs> well, cordyceps, you know, it's a relative. It's a relative of um, morels and a relative of truffles. It's in the same category of mushroom. And yeah. those are very tasty mushrooms, and cordyceps is no, is no exception. I think that the taste of the cordyceps is very much like kind of a, a toast, mm. kind of a, a really pleasant, bland, kind of a, a toasty kind of a taste to it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of TCM energetics, they call it um, bland, mildly warming, and mildly sweet. Mm. Okay. But don't worry about the warming part. It's really very mildly warm. Yeah. Are there additional benefits for for cordyceps that you like, like indications for support? Oh, yeah. Cordyceps has huge indications. Uh, for one, it helps the body to better regulate energy uh, through yeah. its management of ATP. Um, this is one reason why it's being used by athletes to enhance sports performance. Um, yeah. It has, um, it also has a, ben it's also considered to be a true adaptogen as compared to, there's overuse of the word adaptogen and it's not, and many times inappropriate. People are just using it in a blanket because it's now that sexy word out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but in a, terms of an adaptogen, that means that it impacts the pituitary gland and its relationship with the adrenal gland. It's called the, the hy hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and it has to do with the stress response. Mm. And so right now I'm doing a study with cordyceps in horses because horses get a condition called equine Cushing's disease. And that's where they have a, a tumor on the pituitary gland that causes their adrenal gland to, to produce excessive amounts of cortisol and insulin and whatnot. And so we've got a couple of equine holistic vets that are giving horses like a tablespoon of cordyceps a day. We did a measurement in January. We're going to do another measurement in April, and then we'll see what we get from that. I'd also like to use it in dogs with Cushing's disease as well. Yeah. So. So, yeah, so as an adaptogen, it has a great deal of value. Cordyceps is also known to help regulate and also is, has a reputation of being an aphrodisiac because it can also stimulate the production of testosterone in the body. Mm -hmm. So it can help fertility. It can help with, now, most of the animals that I deal with are, you know, are menopausal. They've been neutered or castrated or whatever. But, you know, if you're involved with cats, you may also be involved with breeders. And so, mm -hmm. and so Breeders are where we get more into the reproductive aspects of it. Like next week, they're doing a, we're doing, we're starting this new thing called Fungi Forum with real mushrooms. And we're having like all of our practitioners. We've got a naturopath. We've got a medical herbalist. We've got myself. We've got Sky, who's, you know, who owns the company. And they're going to talk about, because this is national or international women's month or women's week or something like that. So they're going to talk about women's health issues. They want me to participate, you know, and I'm saying, you know, you couldn't have you couldn't have asked a vet to participate in the worst topical topic there is because all of my patients are menopausal. You know, <laughs> and they're talking about polycystic ovary disease and you know, um, menstruation and all that stuff. And you know, <laughs> but I'll, I'll participate. I'll learn a lot from that anyway. That's fascinating. It is fascinating. I need to do a lot more research on cordyceps. It's a Just... good. It's a good mushroom. It's good to know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very, very cool. There's more to it than that. I've got a slide that has you know, 50 different applications for it. Wow. Let me ask you another question. Do you have a favorite mushroom that may help with autoimmune diseases in animals, cats and dogs, or one versus the other more than another? With autoimmune disease, um, you have to be a little cautious you know, about what you do, and you have to sort mm -hmm. of carefully with slow with low doses to begin with because you're never quite certain you know what that individual's reactivity is to anything right. you put, because that's right. kind of a sign of an overreactive immune system so of all of those mushrooms the one that has the most evidence in terms of anything published about it would be the reishi mushroom okay this yep. this beautiful mushroom here sweet and um it had, and, and really, of all the mushrooms, I would have to say that, in my opinion, reishi is the most powerful of them all. Mm -hmm. It's the longest. It has the most amount of history, the most amount of research, and it has a huge number of active ingredients, and it's incredible. So um, I would use reishi. I would step carefully with that, and I'd probably use other 
supplements, I would probably use some CBD. I would use something called PEA. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard of that yet or not, mm -hmm. polypolyamide, um, which can also help with that whole immune regulation. You know, Interesting. Probably something like ashwagandha as well, another adaptogen. Yeah, okay, good to know. Because I know a lot of, sadly, it seems like more pets are developing things like autoimmune issues and it's it you know those pets struggle so much and i i mean i i have i know of people directly that who have cats that are struggling with that issue like pemphigus um but i know there's a lot of dogs that just, that have the same issues and stuff like that so that's good to know so you would just say like really tiny micro dose to start and just see if they're see how their body responds and right i don't know if i use the word micro dose um i have a well known dose which i would probably start with. okay uh, and although reishi is super super bitter it's the yeah. total advantage of your cats to accept it there is some reishi in this new formula i'm coming out for cats and there's okay. reishi in the same formula for dogs but, um, yeah, I would just take it carefully. And, yeah. you know, um, rodent ulcer is, um, yeah. is, is not an autoimmune disease, but it is treatable based on published studies by P with PEA. Nice. By wow. Yeah. Cool. I'll write that down. So I'm I would look at PEA notes. as a way to Me too. The immune system. <laughs> I didn't bring enough paper <laughs> today. Mm -hmm. And PEA is pretty, it's, it's pretty bland tasting. It's pretty. Mm -hmm. Pretty relatively inexpensive. There's some products that yep. are more expensive than others, and, and pretty well tolerated. It doesn't take much at all. I yeah. take myself. I take about a, um, a quarter of a teaspoon. You know, so a cat would probably take more like a sixteenth of a teaspoon. Yeah. Not much. Yeah, yeah. Feline Essential has a new one. He formulated with Dr. Judy. So it's awesome. Uh, who's Feline Essential? I haven't heard that. The two crazy cat ladies. They have a supplement line. Okay, good for them. Yeah, so they worked with Dr. Judy Morgan and created the PEA for cats. Oh, very good for them. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Working so, on yeah. a PEA product with my own brand, um, with my own website, um, but haven't really gotten to do it yet. Probably by the time I get around to it, everybody else will have one already. <laughs> I learned about it about five years ago. And, um, I, I had a bad case of autoimmune disease myself. I had psoriasis of my nail beds. I lost all of my nails. I, oh, wow. I couldn't practice anymore because I couldn't do procedures and things. And PEA was one of the tools I used to bring myself back to health. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. You need to get, <laughs> get your website up and the product going. <laughs> okay. Work um, on that. Yeah. You know, I got the website. I mean, my website's been up for, you know, eight or yeah. ten years now. But um, I don't have a product. Website. Okay. Are they going through the questions here? Um, let me ask you another question. Is there any condition where you would not recommend using mushrooms for pets? Yeah, there there are. I mean, I think mushrooms have a lot of value, but I don't know if I would necessarily assign mm -hmm. a mushroom to every condition that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, well, we commonly get questions in dogs about lipomas, about fatty mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and in my experience, maybe it's just because I'm not that smart of a vet, but I've never been able to treat lipomas medically with any kind of herb or mushroom or anything other than surgically removing them. Um, so that's one. I, I don't think that mushrooms are um, uh, that mushrooms are necessarily effective against every type of cancer either. Um, I think you know. Um, I think you know. It's 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 kind of a mixed bag. Like, let's talk about arthritis. People are saying, you know, ask me a lot. You know, will mushrooms help with arthritis? Well, yes, they will. But with they, but they're not going to help as a standalone, you know. Right. So, so, so the question might be, you know, what what mushrooms would not work as a standalone therapy? Or what mushrooms need to be used combined? We know that mush that some mushrooms, cordyceps, for instance, maitake, for instance, um, can reduce pain and or have analgetic properties. So those would be of value with um with arthritis and certainly reducing inflammation in the body as a whole mm -hmm. and oxidant properties, but um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would really have to go through the, the conditions one by one. I don't yeah. have I don't have a list of what things not to use mushrooms for. And because they're such superfoods and because health mm -hmm. is a multifactorial issue, it's not just about one problem you might have. 
That's why I believe strongly that the daily use of mushrooms as a wellness device, you know, at a fairly low dose is mm-hmm. a great for all of us. And well, the longer I agree. Use, the longer they work. I totally yeah. agree. And I'm glad you said that because I think so many times pet parents are thinking that if I just take this one thing, that's yeah. all I need, you know, and it's never, t- it never tends to be a, a one thing is an end all be all answer to your problem. I think what you stated as using more, using something more in a synergistic way with paired with other things, you're going to get a much better result instead of just relying on one thing to make the difference, you know? Yeah. And I think the fault in part was our advertising industry. Absolutely. And the attention, you know, going to solve your problem just buy this you know yeah and it's, it's it, life is more complicated than this absolutely yeah. yeah if you don't change the how they got the problem to begin with it's never going to go away <laughs> yeah. and it's not going to go away overnight it didn't no. happen overnight it's not going to disappear overnight that's so, so true it's, it's it so is true. a marathon you know, um, mm-hmm. this, your last question leads into one of the only one I see on the outline that we didn't uh, address. And it, what you asked, would you still recommend using a supplement form of mushrooms if someone is going to the grocery store and preparing mushrooms at home on a daily basis? So some, there's, I don't remember where I read this. Um, I read too much and I listen to too much and I get confused, but it was something like an eighth of a cup of um, lightly cooked mushrooms a day is enough to have a benefit. Is that even true? And <laughs> all, all mushrooms have a benefit, you know, edible and medicinal yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, mushrooms are 90% water. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to eat enough of them to get enough of the goodies that they contain. Mm-hmm. Um, the cell wall of the fungus of the mushroom is very, very sturdy, made up of beta glucans and chitin. And inside, it's like a, it's like a, a, a inside, it's very protected by that sturdy cell wall. So you're not going to be able to get as much of the goodies um, if you only cook the mushrooms lightly. So mm-hmm. the mushrooms need to be cooked at least for 15 minutes. Ideally, when the company takes the mushrooms and dries them and then processes them with hot water, it's a two hours at nearly boiling temperatures to get mm-hmm. the, the optimal extraction from it. So what I recommend, if you're going to be cooking fresh mushrooms, and there's nothing, no reason not to do that. They're a great addition to a, to a, a, a meal. They're very um, keto-friendly. They're very paleo, paleolithic diet-friendly. They're high in protein. They're high in fiber. They're low in fat. They're low in carbs. Plus, they're loaded with all these you know, um, beneficial compounds on them. So I think that getting some fresh is good, but I wouldn't depend on that entirely if you've got a actual medical problem you're trying to address and realize that you'll need to give more in order to get more um, more benefits. Okay. So what I do is I recommend dicing them small so that when they cook, they cook through better, you know, mm-hmm. more completely. You know, if you're going to be doing it, if you're sauteing or whatever, however you're doing it first before putting it into your pup's plate, you know, you need to do that for maybe 15 minutes or so. And personally, I would say, you know, saute, if you're going to be cooking them up, saute them with a little bit of garlic, you know, because mm-hmm. it not add the taste, but it also gives the, the medical value of, of the garlic as, as well. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, I've got, I think. Eating mushrooms is good. I eat them every day and I eat as much as I can, I eat quite a bit. But they do say, I think an eighth of a cup is pretty good. They say like you really only need to eat about um, 10 grams of fresh mushrooms a day to be helpful. You know, that should be what you're looking And that's, you know, that's a third of an ounce. That's not much as maybe one mushroom at all. Wow. But more is better. You know, you can't overdo it. So with and- your tink- with your powdered form, obviously you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck to help with the medical condition because they, because of the, what do you call it? It's not compounded, but it's, it's concentrated. Concentrated. Thank you. It's yeah. concentrated. Also standardized. Cause what we do is we make sure that every bottle of each individual mushroom um, is analyzed for its beta glucan content and is standardized. Cause mm-hmm. it will add 
additional beta-glucan content in order to keep it within a narrow range. So most of our products now are about 25% beta-glucan. So that means that each half teaspoon of powder contains um, about 250 milligrams of beta-glucans, which is a nice. pretty nice amount. And yeah. um, we dose them, but we, we can dose based on the beta-glucan content. But since all of our mushrooms are fairly standardized, it's easy just to dose on volume measurement, which is simple, mm -hmm. easy, takes very few computations. And pet parents, um, in my experience working with this company, because this is the first time I've worked with a company that sells both human products and pet products before I was 25 years with just a, a veterinary you know, company, um, that there's a lot more, um, um, cr cr there's that our, our pet parents are bit more critical about the amount they're supposed to give to get an effect. And and I, they use the word dosage, and I don't, and I think that makes mushrooms seem like it's a medicine, which it's mm. not. I really talk about how much to administer, how much, what serving size is. But so I've been trying, I've, I've been back and forth trying to put together a simple table of administration to make it easy for the pet parent. They don't have to get mm. into much math, you know. Get yeah. yeah. Really. <laughs> And and I and I've really I've resolved it pretty much to be you know um, teaspoon measurement you know of of powder based on body weight based on severity of condition. So it's still a work in process. We we had one up there and then somebody found a flaw in it. So I just am in the process of redoing it. <laughs> well, we can't wait for that. <laughs> what am? Yeah. Also, they're just trying to make his life difficult. I'm sorry. Another challenge. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm actually really glad you brought up that um, dosing because Janet and I were talking about that earlier today, that, you know, when we think of dosing, we think of medicine mm -hmm. and we were like racking our brains over like, what would we say instead of dosing? And that was kind of what we came up with as well is like, well, it's a food, so it should be feeding, feeding guidelines or like what, yeah. what you said, the administration or it. <laughs> Serving size, administration Service. guidelines. I'm, try, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to change the language that's being used with as well, and it's yeah. hard because in my own mind, I start, I, I do dose, and then I go, oh, administration. Yep. You know, yeah, right. Sort of, and 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 the part of the idea is to try to change the mindset of the consumer so mm -hmm. they understand that mushrooms really are more of an everyday, long-term process. That is where they have their best benefit. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. What, what was the last part you said, Dr. Silver? Their best benefit is if they're given long term um, every day for the most part. Now, you know, people talk about, you know, do we can, you know, can we take a break or something? And yes, you can. Once you've been on the mushrooms for at least a month, they've already gotten that impact on your immune system. You could actually stop them and they would still have benefit for at least a week or two and as, as though you were still taking them. So I suggest for myself, I take so many stupid supplements, you know, you get sick of them for a while. Me too. So I take, I take the weekend. I go, hey, let's party, yes. you know. I'll pick, I'll pick it up on Monday. <laughs> Well, I do that. Give your body a break, you know, with yeah. pulse things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure I entirely believe in pulsing, but maybe it works. For me, I just, it's just, I just get tired of doing it. Always. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd take a break on certain herbs with my dogs on the weekends. And then there's one that I actually give on the weekend, but not during the week. And um, yeah. I tend to do that with myself, but. One mm -hmm. other question, because you mentioned eat a little bit of mushrooms every day, basically, and that includes giving the to our pets, guys. You know, table Jesus. scraps, as long as they're healthy, are not bad. <laughs> but my, right. so I have five dogs in my household, so we tend to meal prep. So when it comes to the mushrooms, do they lose that potency if I have? You know, I've sauteed them for 15 minutes and, you know, they've gone into a container and I'm going to serve them throughout the week. Is that an issue? No. Mushrooms, the, 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 the active ingredients in mushrooms are actually quite heat stable. That's why they boil them for two hours. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. So, um, you know, except for the, you know, and there's very few very delicate, volatile components to mushrooms. The terpenes, which in cannabis you know, blow off and what you smell so easily um, are very small, single, you know, single um, monoterpenes and they blow off easily like limonene, you know, with lavender and, mm -hmm. and with, with 
Hemonine with with lemon and linalool with lavender, um, but the terpenes in in mushrooms don't. So no, you can certainly do that. You could freeze them. You know, I think those are all fine ways of doing it, and not not to worry about the loss of potency. Good to know. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Mushrooms are cool. Well, I um, do y'all have do you Pam Janet have any other questions? I think we went through all of them. I do too. We did. Sure. <laughs> it was so, a lot of fun. Thank you. I thank you. I I did read one thing not too long before we jumped on, and I I was curious if it's true. Um, okay. And then if it is, that kind of leads me into one last question. So okay. I was reading that shiitake mushrooms, mm -hmm. um, different extracts of shiitake have shown potent antibacterial and antifungal activities, which is great for the whole body, but it says that has, it has also been shown to reduce oral biofilm formation and have anti-gingivitis effects. And I had never, ever, ever thought about mushrooms for dental for health. health. Yeah. Is that, that sounds like a real open thing. Is that it, what we was talking oh, I, about it? You know what? I'm not sure who wrote it. Was on the Adored Beast blog, and I know she, I think she does write some for them. It might have been. <laughs> so yes, um, and 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 not just shiitake mushroom. There's also evidence that lion's mane does. My guess is most of them do. They just haven't done the studies to show it. And and so and you read in that article, no doubt that the biofilm is one thing that helps to protect uh, pathogenic bacteria from being killed by our immune system or by herbs or by antibiotics as well. That's one reason why we get resistant infections. Yeah. yeah, when I think of biofilm, whether it's oral or even, you know, like the gut lining, I my mm -hmm. mind goes to ozone therapy if we've got to break through that. But that's it was just so interesting to me that like, mm -hmm. oh, mushrooms could do this too. <laughs> they can. And um yeah. And so um I think that they talked about with regards to shiitake, that there's actually uh, some evidence that you can make some sort of a mouthwash out of shiitake. That was, I think, what the study was. And they okay. found that by using that mouthwash, in human, I think it was in humans, that they reduced, were able to re you know, measure and reduce the biofilm and then measure improvement because of that shiitake mouthwash. Wow. That is so interesting. And so, like, awesome. out of the realm of what I think of mushrooms for... <laughs> well, well, you know, the, I think fantastic fungi really, you know, helped to open all of our eyes about the many, many possibilities with mushrooms. And we are really only just now scratching the surface. And um, yeah. it's great to have interest in this, in this topic that I think has both global and individual value. And I do appreciate so much for being invited here today to talk. Thank you for being Thank here you so much. Yes, it's always great to pick your brain. It, it <laughs> really is. <laughs> <laughs> um and there there's just so much to get into the weeds about but um i know well, or i i'm sorry have me back yeah well, awesome. absolutely. and i think thank you do, I, I don't know if it's you or Joni or you and Joni do like a weekly live where you do q and a's and stuff where can people okay, so find yeah, you we do, a, we do a once a month live oh. q and a which happens to be tomorrow night oh. nice and um, the way to get to it, access to it, is through our Facebook um, for pets. Um, uh, I think Real Pets Insider, the Real Mushrooms Insider Pets page, and I think that's where we have the links to that. And I'll double check with Joni after we get off here and um, let you know if it's someplace differently. I guess this podcast won't launch by then, but yeah. maybe you'd like to watch it. Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of fun on those Q and A's. It's basically me. And tonight's me and Joni last week or last month. It was me and Jordan because Joni had some other things going on. I love it because to me, it's like stump the stars. I, I take it as a game show. And, <laughs> and, um, and I love it's, you know, it, I was trained to do this, you know, for 30 years in the exam room because, mm -hmm. you know, you the wackiest, most impossible answer questions, you know, in that exam room, you know, when you're just face to face in the privacy of the exam room with the pet parent and their pet questions that, who knew that was a question? So yeah, it's a lot of fun. I've only been stumped once. Ooh. <laughs> what was the question? I don't remember. 
Too many mushrooms. <laughs> I tried to. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was traumatizing. You had to forget it. Um, <laughs> no, I will. I'll, I will. I'll make sure to put links in the show notes to Real Mushrooms and to where people can find your Facebook yes, monthly yes. lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yes. because it, it, you know, of out of anything that we do, pet parents always want some sort of direct access to a veterinarian who knows something, right? And so that's one of, I think, the better parts of social media is that like there are some really wonderful very knowledgeable veterinarians such as yourself who are putting yourself out there so people have access to you and um so i definitely want to make sure that they can find you i am i am starting to get more out there like you know, 25 years has with this veterinary company and you know really was not involved in social media or anything else and now i realize that's where i have to be so I'm getting, I'm starting my own platform, my own educational conversation type platform, uh, cool. maybe some health coaching, but I'd want it to be more general health coaching than one-on-one. -on -one. I want to have groups of people listen while I work with people. So everyone can share on the information and I've got ideas for interviews. I want, I've got a number of, of, um, of, um, animal, um, um, psychics that I'd like to bring on and massage therapists and talk about all the other people that are in the in the pet industry that aren't necessarily talking medical but are all the other things that can be done with it so I'm um, looking forward to that and, uh, like energy work that's what I do <laughs> Reiki is big is, is that the kind of energy work you do no do you, it's not it's different what do you it's do different I I work I do a session called uh, our service called Mind Body Spirit Release, which uncovers trapped, you know, trapped emotions that are stored in the body from negative experiences and traumas and stress and just finding what? finding frequencies and energy. I just work in energy, frequency, and vibration. So, clearing a lot of blocks, helping them to heal, rebalance. It's yeah. pretty muscle cool. testing. You didn't say muscle testing. Oh well, it involves muscle testing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a, a a friend, a colleague, a veterinarian, who uses a pendulum to determine points. <laughs> That's what Pam uses. Yeah, I think pendulum. <laughs> He's <Yeah>. my best friend. <laughs> We're like this. <laughs> yeah. I do it all day, every day. Yep, it's awesome. I love it. Nice. <laughs> well, get going. We'll get you on there. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. Doc Rob. Thank you. We so appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you for all you do for our pets and pet yeah. parents and all the research and the years that you have put into everything that you've learned and shared from herbalism to CBD to non mushrooms and holistic wellness. We just appreciate you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We do. We do. Yeah. So. I like you.